Hello, I'm Helen Arney. I'm Matt Parker. I'm Steve Mould, and you're listening to a podcast of Unnecessary Detail, the podcast where we talk in detail about whatever we like. And this is the second episode in our third series. So if you're keeping score, that's episode 3.2. I'm pushing for this to be a 14 episode season. That's going to be pretty special. But right now, today, I'll be talking about how phones are becoming more like eyes with brains. And I'm talking about how good inventions still need good public relations if they're going to become popular. And I'm going to be looking at some UFO engineering. And that's where UFO stands for uniform filling object. Yes, let's do some detail. My bit of detail for this episode is about the first person to drive an internal combustion engine powered car a significant long distance. It's also about the world's first joyrider. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and the business partner of the inventor of the first commercially produced motor car. It was all the same person. Hey. <laughs> so it's actually far fewer details. <laughs> May we guess how far a significant distance is? Yes, you can. Bearing in mind, this is a car that was patented in the 1880s. Oh, wow. Had three right. wheels okay. and a two-stroke engine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Pulling all of three horsepower. Wow. The old one-cylinder, three horsepower, yeah. three-wheeled. Yeah. That's one horse per wheel. Yeah, it really, it really is. It had two gears. You you know, you had to crank start. It didn't have a gas tank. Wow. I'm going to lowball yep. and say a significant distance is to the shop. <laughs> Do you know what? The shops were a stop on the journey. Oh, okay. So, yes, I'll, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, yes, okay. but definitely yeah. further than the shops. And yeah. how long did this, like, was it a day, several days? It was within a day, yeah. Okay. All right. So, I suspect if the car was going 10 or 20 miles per hour, that's impressive, given the roads probably weren't built for any of yeah. the three wheels. Roads, where we're going, there are, there no, are roads no roads. Just, to... yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not in a good <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, we need roads. And let's say you put in a solid 10 to 100 miles. 100 miles. That's an overestimate. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it was close to 100 kilometers. I thought oh, you were okay. really in there. Okay. Uh, and I then switched you switched units. to Imperial Nuts. at the last minute. Ah, yeah. This is why I don't like using the Imperial system. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were, you were so close. One time I try, I get burnt again. <laughs> right. The person that we talk about is Bertha Benz, who was the wife and business partner and, uh, as far as we can tell, co-engineer of this Benz patent motorwagen. <laughs> Benz rings a bell. Yeah, as in Mercedes-Benz. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So the company went on to become Mercedes Benz. This is 1888, so a long time ago. Bertha Benz decided that uh, although her husband had been working for several years and spending all of their money, which was actually her money from her inheritance, he'd spent all of their money developing this car. But because he was a perfectionist, he didn't want to tell anyone about it. He didn't want to show it to anyone because it wasn't perfect yet. And she realized that it probably never would be perfect. So she just needed to do something to get the news about this invention out so that people would actually start ordering it and they could actually, you know, pay for their five children's shoes. (laughs) So early one morning, without her husband's permission, which was a big deal at the time, guys. uh, But on top of that, um, riding a motor vehicle was also illegal in this part of Germany because oh. the authorities didn't know what to do with it. So they just banned people from driving it apart from under test conditions. This is a joyride. Goodness. Yeah, it was a genuine joy. It was illegal for her to take this car, not only uh, from her husband, but also uh, ride it on open roads. And she drove with her two sons, her two oldest children, to her mother's house. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So she drove a total of 65 miles across a a day with her two kids in this three-wheeled monstrosity. And it was the event that got the press attention that meant that the Benz Patent Motorwagen was what people have now associated with as the first working mass on that scale produced car, like they made quite a few of them, available to buy. Even though other people had started inventing cars and had made perfectly good cars, what Bertha Benz did got the press attention and associated that name with working vehicles. That's Mm. proof of concept, right? Yeah. Yeah, 
it was Priyanka concert. And there was kind of this thing of like, was she a ditzy housewife who just wanted to go visit her mother with her two children? <laughs> like, oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> or was she a public relations genius? Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of both, but also a massive chunk of incredible, ingenious engineering that she had to do along the way. Obviously, this like hunk of junk patent motor car <laughs> had never been on a journey this far before. And she discovered a whole bunch of things about basically why. <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason for yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> there's a reason for that. It's sort of turned into this epic story where, you know, the spark plug started losing their insulation. So she used the elastic from her garter to re-insulate some wiring. She invented leather brake pads because the brake pads had worn down. So she like <laughs> got some shoe leather and reinvented brake pads. She had the idea for having more than one gear, which was frankly a good idea because she had to get two boys from a village to push them up the hill. <laughs> she had to go into the shops. Steve, you were right. She had to pop into a pharmacist and basically buy like industrial solvent because there were no petrol stations. <laughs> Oh, that was the refueling. <laughs> yeah, that was the refueling. No one had ever gone this far, so no one had ever had to have a, like a fuel tank, and you had to refuel on the go. So this pharmacy in the Black Forest somewhere has the unenviable title of being the first gas station in the world. That's incredible. Amazing. Because she popped out and bought some Ligroin. It's kind of like a paraffiny solventy thing that you use for like getting really bad stains out of clothes. But hey. It burns a treat when you put it in the Benz part and motor wagon. Yeah, she managed to get there and call back to her husband and say, oh, hi, by the way, I've just, you know, solved all of our problems and everyone's <laughs> going to want one of these now. And he said, great, <laughs> can you get it back to me now? Because we've got like a motor show that we need to go to next week. Was this the journey where she had to take the brakes into a cobbler to get them effectively just reshoed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, <laughs> exactly. That is exactly it. That's incredible. And all of this ingenious stuff, like clearing a fuel line with a hat pin, that kind of stuff. What do engineers do? They make the best thing they can out of what is available within the parameters of possibility in the real world. And that is exactly what Bertha Benz did. So the only reason this epic voyage was possible was because there was someone on board who knew some stuff yeah. <laughs> about this thing. Had a can-do yeah. attitude. Yeah, and yeah. it's kind of, I think the the story has like progressed over time and what we know about it now, I think, has been like changed and distorted over time from the real thing. But there absolutely is some truths about it. Like when Bertha Benz was born, her father wrote under her name in the family Bible the words, unfortunately, just a girl again. Oh, dang. Which was, oh <laughs> yeah, which is like absolutely wild. And in reaction to this and reaction to like society as it was, she learned mathematics and science and she went out of her way and against her family's wishes to learn engineering and to learn all this stuff. And then she managed to find a husband who was like-minded. Cool with that. And she had loads yeah. of money. He had loads of ideas. And between them, they set up a business together. So they were business partners. And there is an argument that the only reason that she is not named on the patent is because married women were property. Therefore, married women could not be named on a patent because <laughs> you, you can't put your yeah. kettle on a patent. So therefore, you can't put your wife. Yeah. Just when I think that we've had the worst <laughs> part of the story... <laughs> <laughs> oh no no we haven't even got to the worst oh, part of the story yeah. as well yeah so what i've done is I <laughs> so i've written a song that tries to bring this whole story together and tell it in a way that remains true to some of the truth in the story but allows some of this kind of stuff that's accreted onto the myth over time because there's also like a quite a dark side to this that you start reading up biographies of Bertha Benz and you look at like oh um, she was born in Germany she lived in Germany her whole life in 1943 thereabouts it says finally you know Bertha Benz's contribution to engineering was recognised oh that's good uh, yeah which is great by being bestowed an honorary degree by this technical university in Germany in 1943. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> just construed <laughs> oh, from that who it was who decided to basically use her as propaganda. Uh, she died in 1944 when she was like well into her 90s. 
And at the beginning of the war, she was a, how can we describe it? A not unenthusiastic Nazi. Oh, that's... Uh, yeah. That's, that's described. This was a marketing trip from beginning to end. Gonna... Yeah. So we don't yeah. really have a lot of evidence about her real opinions about Germany at that time. But we do know that she suddenly became this propaganda item. And one of the reasons her story is well known is because of that, because she was used and her journey was used as a propaganda item. Mm. But also we know less about it because it's got some really horrific associations now. And that for me is like a really interesting mess of details yeah. it starts off being one story turns into another story and turns into a third story when you start digging and digging and digging and digging so i'm sort of trying to reclaim the story at the time that it was but when you listen to the song you'll kind of hear that there's there's little bits of the reality of what happened later in her life as well so it's basically my mission in life to write amazing songs about badass women of science history, but also not to kind of put them on a pedestal and sort of fall into this trap of like the lone genius or, you know, the perfect example of a human being. Because I feel like a lot of men from science history are allowed to be complicated and they're allowed to make mm -hmm. mistakes and they're allowed to do really not very nice things. They're allowed to be a little bit Nazi. <laughs> yes, yeah, some of them are Brenda Von Brown. And like, <laughs> it's harder, I think, for women in science because there are fewer of them that are so well known. It's harder for them to be flawed and complicated and messy and do things wrong and have bad opinions and also do some amazing things and some dreadful things. Let people be people. Otherwise, it's kind of not really equality, is it? If like women have to be more perfect than perfect and guys can be like, oh, great scientist, heinous person. Let's just not mm. worry about that. This is my attempt to do that. Mrs. Benz. Mrs. Benz. Mrs. Benz. Mrs. Benz. Mrs. Benz. Over here, Mrs. Benz. How did you do it? What were you thinking, Mrs. Benz? Gentlemen, Mrs. Benz. gentlemen, calm yourselves, please. You want to know how I got here in this marvellous mechanical moving machine. Available, I must add, exclusively from the Carl Benz Motor Company. Let me tell you exactly what happened. Shh. Creep, not a peep. Your father's still asleep. Don't wake your sister, Eugene. She's not coming to Grandma's house today. Boys pack neat. There's not much room behind the seat. No, Ricard. You can't bring that or that. Definitely not that. Stop. This floorboard squeaks. And that barn door creaks Slowly Open up See the moon is bright We'll be gone before the morning light Eugene left Ricard right Now push with all your might We're stealing the Carl Benz patent motor wagon Three wheels, two seats, one ignition, and zero permission. Whoopsie! We're stealing the Carl Benz patent motor wagon 50 metres from our door. I've never gone this far before. I've never gone this far. This desperate time calls for a desperate measure. My carnapping crime is no joyride for pleasure. Our money's all spent, but our bills keep on rising. Carl says it's not ready, he keeps on devising, fiddling and fussing, resizing, revising. Stop! You're an idiot, Carl. Why do you listen to me? Start to sell this thing now or you'll ruin our family. Hmm. <clears throat> what I mean is... It's time the world knew what your machine can do. Turn the crank, boys. Take a risk if you want to progress. First gear, make a call. Yes, I told a few friends in the national press. Release the brake. This ride could propel us to a bankrupt mess. Or the first long distance, two gear, three wheel, four stroke, five star, internal combustional engine or powered success. That's it. We're moving. Jump up, 
forward now, quickly, boys. We're driving the Carl Benz patent motor wagon. Three bags, two boys, one marriage. All riding on a horseless carriage. We're driving the Carl Benz patent motor wagon. Ten miles from our door. No wife has ever gone this far before. No wife has ever gone this far. What? Why are we stopping? Oh, no, 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 no. Not in front of all these people. Oh, Scheibenkleister. Ah, hello. Haben Sie einen Mechaniker? Get a horse. I'll take that as a nine, then. Ricard, no tears, my darling. And don't you dare throw that back at them, Eugene. Ignore those peasants. Don't stoop down to their level. It seems our presence proves that women on wheels are in league with the devil. How in hula are you getting out of this one, Bertha? Head down, sleeves rolled. I'll show them all how far this girl can go. Hokey dokey. What's going on in here then? Fuel line locked. I need something to poke in. The tool for the job? Well, it's right here in my hat pin. Brake pads worn to the end of their tether like mine. I'll patch them all up. With a piece or two of leather. Did I just invent brake pads? Nice. Spark plug. That's shocking. Ow. Literally. This one feels much more drastic. I need insulation. Something that's plastic. Something elastic. <laughs> nothing. I've got nothing. Ah, oh, verdammter Schrotthaufen, Karl. Can you please stop that racket? I'm trying to think. I must fix up this junk, or my plans are non-starter. There's nothing to hand, so it's time to be smarter. They're back with their pitchforks to make me a martyr. There's more here at stake than just failing to charter a course without horses. Please, no, I won't go back to Carl on my knees as a failure with holes in my... In my stockings! Elastic, you say? Fantastic. I'll use my garter! Well, that's a lesson learned. Don't wear your best underwear on the world's first road trip. Crank it now, Eugene. Don't give up. We must persevere. First gear. Don't give in while Bertha Benz is here. Brake release. There's more to me than just your mother, dear. It's time for the truth. I am an engineer. I did it. I actually did it. Bertha Benz patent motor bargain. Three bags, two boys, that's one precious load. Someone please invent the tarmac road. So why drive your Benz patent motor bargain 50 miles from our door? I couldn't wait a moment more. Stand aside while someone else took the floor. Grabbing global attention as their new invention opened up the world for all to explore. I risked my life, I risked my sons, but this is war, it must be won. So this ride will make our names synonymous. We won't just be anonymous inventors without even a sniff of a claim. We're not the first, we're not the best, but we can cut through all the rest. I know that public relations is the name of the game. I'll say I did it for my children, that might make me seem less callous. Say I did it for my country, for our Deutschland über alles. Or perhaps, to just some minuscule degree, I'd never say it, but I did it for me. 
No one knows how far this could No one knows how far we would No one knows how far I will go What's that, Eugene? Yes, it's Grandma's house We made it, boys, we made it Arriving in our Ben's patent motor wagon Three wheels, two seats, one ignition Completed the mission Surviving the first Ben's patent motor wagon 66 miles door to door No one has ever gone this far To make the world fall in love with a car When my escapade is lauded and applauded or ignored it ah, As if you'd pass up a story this good One thing we can all agree There you go. That was the incredible Helena Rayburn singing a nine minute opera about Bertha Benz uh, with my co composer Jenny Pinnock on the piano. Now, if you want to listen to that again at your own leisure, you can go to my Bandcamp page at helenarney.bandcamp.com and uh, download the whole thing for free on the podcast of Unnecessary Detail album. I think it's called An Album of Unnecessary Detail. And you can enjoy the fact that Christopher Nolan took three hours to paint a complicated portrait of troubled genius Oppenheimer, and we only took nine minutes. So who's the winner here? I once pulled into a shopping centre and heard an awful noise coming from the car exhaust. So I squatted down, looked underneath the car, and the exhaust had broken off like one of the junctions halfway along. So I went into the shops and bought a spatula and some cable ties <laughs> and kind of splintered it back together. So I, now, I, now I know I was doing a Bertha. Because I do all my own filming of my YouTube videos, I've become quite familiar with how cameras work. And it's Interesting to see the parallels between cameras and eyeballs, especially with the way modern cameras on phones work. It's not just the physical, mechanical comparisons that you can make. You can also compare what does your brain do with the information that comes from your eyes versus what does your phone do with the information that comes from your camera. Is that a case of we've deliberately made cameras to match our vision? Or is it a case of just convergent evolution? If you want to capture images, that's the best solution. Yeah, that's a good question. It's probably a bit of both. Our eyes and brains do so much processing that if you just naively take a picture with a camera, it's not going to look anything like the human experience of vision. So we have to process images so they match what our brain thinks things look like. Exactly. Is this like the black and blue, uh, white and gold dress? I mean, it's definitely related to that. That's definitely an aspect of the comparisons that I'm making, specifically about white balance, which we'll get to. But some of it's straightforward, like the mechanical stuff. Like, So human eyes have a pupil and cameras have an iris. So in bright light conditions, your pupil closes up, becomes small. You have to do the same thing with your camera. You have to close down the aperture. You close down your pupils partly to protect your retina from being overwhelmed by too much light. But actually, it's more like um, an evolutionary thing. So like, ideally, from a survival point of view, you want everything in your field of vision to be in focus. And you achieve that by getting as close as possible to basically a pinhole camera. So you know, the smaller your pupil is, the more things are in focus. Oh, okay. Yeah, so like the ultimate reason pupils shrink in bright light is because we want our eyes to be pinhole cameras so that everything is in focus. The problem is that the smaller your pupils are, the less light can get in. So it's only possible to have pinhole camera eyes when there's lots of light. Whereas in low light, we need to open up our pupils. And the price you pay for that is everything's blurry except for that one depth that you're focusing on. It's blurry, but you can see it. Yeah. As opposed to it's incredibly 
sharp, sharp but, but there's no, can't it's see really it. dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I do feel like this is one of the reasons I walk into the same bits of furniture in my bedroom in the middle of the night when <laughs> yeah. I go into one of the kids or something. And I absolutely swear I know where things are and I don't. Yeah. And this is part of the processing as well that goes on. Your brain has a picture already about what everything is, where oh, everything yeah. is. Cameras are starting to add that in. But really, what you think you see is often just your expectations. Have you ever done the experiment where you take a card out of a deck without looking at it and you hold it like just behind your vision yeah. at arm's length and very slowly rotate it into view without looking, like looking ahead? And you're like, well, I can see it. And your brain's like, there's a card there. But because it doesn't know what it actually is, you suddenly realize how little information. Yeah. It's got to come a long way around before suddenly your brain will fill in what the card is. Yeah. So everything on the sides in our peripheral vision is our brain having a good old guess. Exactly. But I bet if you moved it back again, you'd be like, yeah, I can still yeah. see what it is because yeah. your yeah. brain yeah. is like, totally yeah, yeah, I know yeah. it's a oh, seven yeah. of clubs. Of so of course clubs. it's a seven of clubs. <laughs> I can definitely see it. <laughs> Yeah, that chair was definitely there last night, and, and now it's on no my one's shin. moved it. Yeah. <laughs> what is this is, your chair? What is happening? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sticking with like the physical similarities, cameras and eyes also both have a fixed lens and an adjustable lens for changing the focal distance. So your cornea, that's like the fixed bit of glass on the front of a camera lens. And then behind the cornea, past the pupil, you've got this adjustable lens. Interestingly, the focal distance of the lens is adjusted by squishing and stretching it, whereas in a camera, the adjustable lens moves backwards and forwards inside the housing, like instead of being squished and stretched like in the eye because it's made of glass. But the cool part is people who have had cataract surgery, they have that lens removed because it's cloudy, and it's replaced with a plastic lens. And that plastic lens acts more like the lens inside a camera. So it doesn't get stretched and squished. Instead, it's got this kind of lever mechanism around the edges of the lens that causes the lens to move backwards and forwards in the eye when it's pushed on by the muscles in your eye. Oh, wow. So just like a camera. So we replicate the squishiness. Yeah. What? So if you've had cataract surgery you are more like a camera than anyone else <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> bionic we touched on this one thing that used to be only true of the human eyes and human brain is this filling in of details we feel like we can see lots of details in our peripheral but that's our brains filling in the detail. And when you actually test it with something like a playing card, we realise actually we don't know what's going on in the periphery as well as we think we do. Also, we perceive more detail than we can actually see, again, because of our experiences. But now that's beginning to happen in computational photography as well. So you can enhance the resolution of an image. Like, you know, the, the old joke of like in like zoom, CSI, enhance. zoom in, enhance, exactly. <laughs> And you laugh at that because you can't gain information that isn't there. So you can't zoom in and enhance. But what you can do with AI is zoom in and make up the details. <laughs> you know, zoom and like, guess. Yeah, yeah zoom and guess. Gorgeous. It's no good for yeah. CSI because you're making up <laughs> information. But yeah. if you want to make a picture look nice and sharp, then you can do it. And so that's beginning to creep in to computational photography. But also like in Photoshop, for example, like a good example of filling in the peripheral details, it's called generative uncrop. So, you know, you can crop an image and make it smaller. But if you do the reverse and go outwards, you've got all this blank space. But Ooh. Photoshop will now just fill that in with have what makes what? sense based on the image that you do have. It's weirdly wow. impressive. So, yeah, artificial intelligence is really kind of blowing the lines between cameras and human brains people often ask about what's the frame rate or the shutter speed of human vision because cameras have those things but there isn't really a direct equivalent when you're taking a video you're taking lots and lots of images at regular intervals and then you decide like for how long am i going to expose that image for each frame but human vision is a continuous process but there are analogies like in low light situations you experience more motion blur because 
the visual system is having to add together information over a larger period of time to be able to generate an image. The other thing to think about when you put your camera into manual mode is ISO. I don't know how many people are familiar with ISO, but if you put a camera in manual mode, it's something you have to think about. It's basically a measure of how sensitive the sensor is, but only in a roundabout way. Like if you've opened up the aperture of your camera to let lots of light in and you've slowed down the shutter speed to get even more light in, but the image is still too dark, then that's when you turn up the ISO. The way the ISO works in a camera is like this. The sensor is basically sending numbers to the camera. If a pixel is dark, it sends a low number. If it's bright, it sends a high number. When you turn up the ISO, all you're doing is multiplying those numbers to get bigger numbers. No. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. ridiculous. I know. You're not increasing the I sensitivity of the pixels. I dislike that immensely. I know. So, I thought it was just going to sum over a longer period of time. No. That's the shutter speed that you're thinking about. You open the shutter for longer to get more exposure. Oh, you're right. So to make it more sensitive instantaneously... It just multiplies the values. I've yeah. never been so disappointed by multiplication <laughs> in my life. Wow. <laughs> not adding any information. Right. Here's the, here's the issue with it as well. So you get everything brighter in the image than it would have been otherwise. The problem is those low numbers that you're getting from the sensor that you're turning into large numbers, they're more influenced by random fluctuations. Even when there's no light hitting the sensor, most pixels will still report a tiny amount of activity from like thermal noise, even quantum interactions. So when you turn up the ISO and multiply all those numbers, it's possible to actually see those random fluctuations across the sensor. That's the graininess you see in low light videos. It's something sometimes called noise. I'm starting to feel Matt rage now. <laughs> like, Matt levels of rage about this number now. A real emotional journey. Because then I was like, well, actually, just the multiplying is going to take all the condensed data at the bottom of the range and like spread it out. Yeah. But then you're right. It's going to scoop up a bunch of noise at the same time. Yeah. You know, my favorite thing about ISO is. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> We've all got one. I do. <laughs> Please share. Because for everything else that gets an ISO name, it's something, a proper name. Yeah. Whereas ISO is just named after the International Standards Organization. Like, <laughs> yeah, that is weird, the, isn't it? What? The acronym has nothing to do with what it is. It's named after the organization that should have given it a proper name. So <laughs> yeah. I think that's very funny. It's for the same reason that if you take an image of a DVD or a CD the image file extension is .iso. Oh, yeah. Because Same it's folks. a standardized thing. Same people. Uh, Didn't give it a proper yeah. name. <laughs> it's like if you go to Steve and say, any suggestions for what I should name my child? And he just says Steve <laughs> over and over. <laughs> no, it's like he just says child. Just says child. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's what Have I you it, considered yeah. calling it child naming book? <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, does the human eye have anything like an ISO? And it does, but it works very differently. So with the ISO in a camera, you're not actually changing the sensitivity of the sensor. You're just multiplying the information from the sensor by some number. When the human eye increases its ISO, it's actually increasing the sensitivity of the pixels in the retina, the pixels being the rod and cone cells. Basically, every time one of these cells sends a signal to your brain, it has to reset before it can become useful again, because some chemical process took place. A molecule called opsin has changed in some way, and it needs to be changed back before it can be used again, before it's ready to receive a photon of light and send a signal to your brain. So in low light situations, that chemical rejuvenation process is ramped up. It takes a few minutes. So when you enter a dark room and you're eyes are adjusting it's not just that your pupils are opening up it's that you're ramping up this chemical process to get opsins working again more quickly so it is closer to a film camera it's just a more sensitive chemical reaction yeah. or i guess in this case it's a faster replenishing chemical reaction with film cameras when you adjust the iso on a film camera what you're actually doing is taking the film out and putting a new <laughs> film in. Getting some other film and putting it in, yeah. <laughs> so you, you look at your film canister and it'll say ISO 100. And you think, oh, that's what I want. But then in a low light situation, you'll take that film out. You'll grab the ISO 500 film and you'll put it in your camera. Because it's the chem it's literally the chemicals on the film that react more sensitively to the light. I'm just trying to remember which way around the ISO scale goes. But it is bigger numbers are bigger more Bigger number is sensitive. more sensitive, more Got noise, it. yeah. 
So, Helen, you mentioned the blue gold. What was it? Blue gold or black gray or something? What was it? It was like the dress, the picture of the dress that some people swore was blue and black and other people swore was white and gold. Yeah. So your brain does this amazing thing called white balancing. Well, I'm calling it white balancing because that's what you call it with cameras. You're adjusting for the difference in light temperature around you. And for me, it's really surprising. Like when you put a camera into manual mode and you have to adjust the white balance, the difference is incredible. You set up your camera for taking pictures indoors and it looks great. And you take it outside and everything's just blue. You can't believe the difference. And the fact that your brain is doing that adjustment instantly, not your brain, your visual system, it happens before it gets to your brain, is incredible. And it's because we evolved this ability to just see things for what they are, right? So, you know, in the evening, the sunlight is more orange. In the daytime, it's more blue. But our conscious brains don't want to have to worry about, God, why has this thing changed color? Right? We just want to know what it is, this thing that's permanent and constant and unchanging. We really want to perceive it as constant and permanent and unchanging. So we do this white balance thing where we correct for that change in color over the course of the day. But cameras, you have to do it manually or your camera does it automatically. And, and that's the interesting thing with the dress illusion. It exposes the way white balancing works in people's visual systems because you take loads of cues from the world around you. Like... I'm looking at this dress. It's been cropped. So I don't know if we're indoors. I don't know if we're outdoors. I don't know if it's bright in the middle of the day. I don't know if it's evening. I'm affected by all the things that are around me. I'm affected by what time of day is I'm looking at the dress. So my brain's making all these decisions. My visual system's making all these decisions about how is this dress illuminated? Some people's brains assume that the dress is illuminated by bright daylight. Some people's brains assume that the dress is illuminated by evening light. And that's how you get the difference. So what it's really illuminating is that some people are wrong because it was definitely white and gold. <laughs> was it the real dress was white and gold, was it? No. No, no it was blue and black, blue wasn't and black. it? <laughs> I mean... So it's illuminating that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another cool thing is like HDR, high dynamic range. So... Like if you point a camera at a mountainside on a sunny day, you have a choice. You can either turn down the exposure and you'll get lots of lovely details of the clouds, or you can turn up the exposure and get lots of lovely details of the mountains, but you can't have both. Either the mountains are going to be underexposed so you can see the clouds, or the clouds are going to be overexposed so you can see the mountains. What you can do with a camera is you can take two pictures at two different exposures or three pictures at three different exposures and then you go into photoshop and you merge the pictures together so you can have the mountains with lots of details and the clouds with lots of details the human brain does it automatically and now brilliantly smartphones do it automatically as well our brains will show us all the detail of the mountains all the detail of the clouds we don't have to think about it consciously we just see it so if we want our smartphones to do the same thing and to present us with an image that matches our perception of the real world, then our smartphone has to do the same thing. It has to stitch together the low exposure and the high exposure and show it as much more flat than it really is. Is that why back in the day, photos of sunsets were always deeply underwhelming? Yes. <laughs> sunsets was exactly really? what I was going to bring up. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's exactly it. It just also feels like one of those things that science cannot capture the wonder of nature yeah. and like the majesty of that moment live for the moment it can if it multiplies it correctly yeah, yeah it, it can now so basically yes uh all romance from sunsets is gone because yeah. you can now photograph them correctly our brains kind of crop in to some extent, I mean, th th this is an ad hoc hypothesis, but our brains crop in. You know, you look at the moon and you go, God, it's amazing. You t pull out your phone. How big it is. Try and yeah. take, a, take a picture yeah. of the moon. It's this dot, it's isn't dot. it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like I've got some photos of the eclipse from 2017. We happened to be in the States with my daughter who managed to see an eclipse before she was one. We're going out to Canada next year to do the same thing. <laughs> She's got to tick off number two. Yeah, we took some photos uh, of like this incredible experience. And I just wish I had never even got 
my camera out because they were just the worst photos, like complete, absolute, utter waste of time. I should have lived for the moment. You know what you should do? I don't see a solar eclipse without bringing a solar physicist with me. Oh, that's where I'm going wrong, isn't it? That, that's what I'm doing wrong. The, you, the yeah. equipment's a lot better. The expertise are yeah. right there. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Here's something I figured out about my weird career. It's really important that I'm always making incremental improvements. Because I make podcasts and videos about STEM subjects, a big part of that incremental improvement is just learning more science or maths or engineering. And the way my brain works is I need to find hacks to get myself doing that. One hack that always works incredibly well for me is finding ways to make it fun. And Brilliant.org does that perfectly. Like, I used to play lots of puzzle games, but now I just play brilliant.org instead which is possible by the way because it works on mobile as well as desktop it gives my brain the same amount of dopamine but now i'm also learning about coding or data visualization or quantum computing or whatever the fact that the courses are so interactive doesn't just make them more fun it also makes it so that you're actually going to retain what you've learned if you're the type of person who likes listening to a podcast of unnecessary detail, it's likely that you have a technical job that requires incremental improvement to stay ahead. Why not make it fun with Brilliant.org? Get started now with a 30-day free trial. And if you love it and want to upgrade to annual premium membership, the first 200 unnecessary detail listeners will get 20% off. Follow the link in the show notes or visit our special URL, brilliant.org forward slash A-P-O-U-D. Matt, we've had two examples of where uh, humans and engineering have interacted. Yeah. What have you got uh, on that borderline? More humans. I've got <laughs> oh, no. humans well, arguing over already. engineering. <laughs> Who's coming out worst on this? Is it the humans or the engineering? Well, Ooh. this is architects versus engineers. Okay. So oh, okay. it depends which side you're on. The ultimate battle. Of that epic battle throughout history <laughs> of architects who want things that look nice and engineers who want to make it easy to build. Specifically in this case, actually, you know what? It's a little bit the, the kind of construction builders are on the side of the architect, which is controversial. Mm. Yeah. But there was an architectural firm was designing a bar, originally a restaurant, now it's a bar, to go on top of a hotel in Barcelona. And they wanted to design the bar to look like a UFO had just landed on the building. Oh, nice. Very cool. cool. Spectacular views. So what they wanted to do is kind of have like the classic UFO, like we're all imagining from sci-fi, the bottom half, like a clamshell thing, the bottom half of the clam would be concrete and the top half would be a glass dome. Nice and big. People can go in there, have a drink, have a meal, walk around without hitting their heads, look out through the glass, enjoy the scenery. And the architects slash construction people went to uh, my mate, Paul Shepard, an engineer, and said, look, can you engineer us up this dome? We want it to be glass. We want it to look like a UFO. And ideally, we want it to use as few different shaped bits of glass as possible. Oh. Right. And specifically, they were doing triangles. So they said, look, could you make us this dome? And it'd be really handy if you can uh, make all the triangles exactly the same shape. Because if one well, breaks, yeah. has to be replaced. Mm. That can be a real pain. Of glass, and oh, if they only keep <laughs> no, one, no, no, no. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, oh, I'm very dear. sorry. <laughs> if you only like, if they're all the same triangle, you don't have to have as many spares on. It's cheaper to manufacture in the first place. All of that. If they're all the same triangle, building it is easier. Maintaining it is easier. So Paul's challenge now was: Can I find a dome that only uses one type of triangle? So I thought I would try and solve it when, when he mentioned this. I was like, well, how would I do that? I don't know how you folks would go about it. I thought to myself, Steve, you're thinking, what are you? What yeah, are you I on? would start off with one of the platonic solids, probably the one that has the most faces. That would be the uh, icosahedron. Icosahedron. 20 triangles. Yeah. And then I maybe take the center of each triangle, pull it out yep. a little bit. So that it then that the the central point that I've pulled out sits on the surface of the sphere that all the other points are on the circumsphere. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that triangle will be uh, not equilateral, but it'll be isosceles, and that they'll all be the same then. But then, 
I suppose you'd then slice that. You'd have a full sphere of that. You'd have to slice the top off to get the right shape for the spaceship. But then there aren't that many triangles in there. Then it's too. It, they're too big. It's not round enough at that point. You've hit the two major problems in one. First Come of all, on. I like your starting good. with a platonic solid, and kind of popping it out by yeah. splitting the faces into more triangles. But to do that, you're going to have two different types of triangles. No. Uh-oh. Are you? Because you can't put a point right in the middle. You're going to get rhombi. And if you split the center into a central, like four triangles, one triangle in the middle and then the three corners, yeah, you're going to have... Hold on. If I've got a triangle... You, uh, you know what? You could do it just a point in the middle to get three triangles going out. Yeah. But... But they're very funny triangles. They're sort of Yeah, and the edges are base. still going to be below the surface. I'm potentially polluted by knowing that you want to get the edges need to be popped out to the sphere as well. Oh, okay. If you're only pulling out the centers of the triangles, I uh, don't think you're going to get more sphery. Yeah. To use a technical phrase. Yeah. What would you... Oh, no, actually, you know what, Steve? Uh, give me one second. I think... I think you might. God, the suspense is killing me. I'm trying to see if they're. What I'm doing for people who are wondering, I'm looking at the Catalan solids to see if Steve has just described one of them. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Because that would be. The settlers of Catalan. That's them. That's them. I think. uh, You know what, Steve? I think that would work. I'm going to give you a yes. Thank you. Okay, I have an issue with it, though. It's too round to be. A UFO, like UFOs are like a donut, yep. but with the hole covered, right? So what yeah. you're describing, yeah. Steve, though, is like a ball. So it's going to be like the top half of a ball. Yep. So it's going to look bad because it's going to look like a cartoon ice cream on top of a concrete <laughs> base, right? You know, like, yep. you, you, like a, you know, woo, it's a semicircle. It's a semicircle is what it's going to look like from the side. And that doesn't look like a UFO. That looks like someone has... um been forced to make it out of triangles yeah. and to not fulfill the brief. So surely that's not right either. Yeah. You're also absolutely correct. <sighs> if there's not enough triangles, it doesn't look like a part of a smooth dome because to get just the UFO bit, you don't want a full hemisphere. No. You just want a little cap to give you a give you a dome effect. And if you chopped off the skinny bit at the top, that's too flat as well, yeah. right? Oh, <laughs> disaster. Steve, your shape. You started with an icosahedron, yeah. 20 faces, and then you split them into three triangles each. So you'll have 60 identical triangles. Yes. I've now convinced myself you're correct. That all works. Great. I did the same thing, but I just looked up what is the shape with the most faces that's made out of identical triangles. <laughs> <laughs> and by identical faces, that's something called face transitive. That means every face is identical to every other face. Relative to the nearby faces, the the way that they're arranged could distinguish one face from another, which is a slight detour. But mathematicians get very obsessed with being face transitive. That means you cannot distinguish one face from another, even if you look at the surrounding faces. Right, I understand. And we need that for to be a sphere, to look a bit like a nice, consistent oh, okay. So, so the architects also care about that, not just the mathematicians. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. It turns out there's a second group of people who care. <laughs> <laughs> the disdiacus triacontahedron. Oh. Sorry. Pardon? You heard me. It's <laughs> got... I, I really didn't. 120 <laughs> faces, which is what that name means. Actually, that name means okay. it's got... 30 faces, each split into four further faces, giving you 120 all in. I can hear Steve's keyboard. (laughs) I need to. I can hear Steve googling that in the background. (laughs) (laughs) It is the most faces you will get on a face transitive shape. It looks like, is it just the dodecahedron with the center pulled out of each face? You can imagine it if people want to picture, or you shape fans, a regular pentagon dodecahedron Mm -hmm. and then imagine turning each pentagon into 10 triangles that all meet in the middle yes 10 10 give me a little cheeky count how does a pentagon become 10 triangles each edge gives you 
Oh, you're pulling five. out the edge, not the centre of the face. Yeah, then you split again. Yeah, so the edge just pops out as well. Holy cow. Okay. And there's other ways of imagining it. It's actually based on a shape made from 30 rhombi, and then each rhombus is split into four triangles, and that gives you the total of 120. Okay. It's a really cool Oof. shape. I'm a big fan. And because it's the shape with the most face transitive faces, it's also the biggest possible fair dice, spherical ah. fair dice imaginable. And you wouldn't believe what website you can buy one of them from, Steve. Well, I was thinking somewhere like <laughs> mathscare.co.uk. Oh, yeah, yeah, for all your mathematical <laughs> oh, toys and needs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have any need to declare a conflict of interest there. I don't think so. <laughs> I certainly don't. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, you're well away from it. <laughs> Helen wants nothing to do with this product placement, <laughs> which came up organically. So, <laughs> your very clever off-the-cuff solution with 60 faces, I did a research, 120 is as good as you can do. Even with the case of 120, if you take a cap off it to become the top of the UFO, mm-hmm. it's only two triangles distance from the bottom of the dome to the very top of the dome yeah. which number Eww. one makes it look super triangly which no one likes yeah and secondly just structurally for this thing to be big enough for people to walk around in these are going to be meters and meters long triangles yeah. and both you can't manufacture glass that big very easily and then structurally it's not going to hold together very nicely I mean, you could get over this by having like a, a sort of tier system that if you're over six foot, you can have a table in the middle. Uh, yes. But if you're uh, <laughs> sort of five foot five and under, you can sit in the, the outer tables. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're a child, you can sit right like right near the edge. You must yeah. be under but, this yeah. sign to sit around, <laughs> this to is get the great. View around the edge. A restaurant yeah. that has kids' tables. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. With the best view. Yeah. Oh, no, they won't be able to see over the edge. No, but it works because <laughs> okay, everyone's so... tiered. So the, the further back you are, the taller you are, so you can still see. Yeah, yeah it's true. actually really fair. It. Yeah. What are the triangles like on this? Are they quite close to being equilateral triangles or are they quite long and pointy or what are they like? They look like a classic right-angled triangle. They're quite oh, okay. scaling. Oh, yeah. Okay. They've got a very long yeah. hypotenuse and then one long side, and then another quite short side. So okay. they're, they're pretty pointy. It's just terrible. Terrible all around for, yeah. for building. An absolute unit of a triangle. <laughs> An absolute unit of a triangle. <laughs> yeah. So Paul now had a problem. He couldn't meet all the requirements that they had given him. Looks like a UFO made from all the same triangle were mathematically impossible to achieve. You cannot do both. You've got to pick one. All the same triangles or looks like the top of a UFO. So he went back to them and he came up with a solution very similar to what Steve said, but he repeated it more times. Sorry, repeated it as in more triangles or just kept saying it? <laughs> just kept saying it. Oh, well, <laughs> spoiler, <laughs> that's <laughs> about to come up. <laughs> <laughs> so he started with an icosahedron. <laughs> he split each face into four triangles and then split it into more triangles and split it into more triangles. And each time, like Steve was saying, he popped them out. Like, isn't he lifted up the corners, the vertices, to keep it as sphere as possible? Uh-huh. The issue is, the moment you start doing that, you get triangles that are mm. subtly different shapes. Oh, no. Subtly different is a lot worse, isn't it, than about two very different shapes. I mean, shapes. if they're subtly different shapes, then the solution is just make them all the same shape and just put some filler in there. Or like, you know, the frame that holds the glass, just make it wider Ooh, here and narrower there. Yeah. They were not happy with this. They, they, ah. It was, oh. yeah. I like what you're doing. Oh. You're right. You could yeah. fill in some gaps. So the glass is the same and you compensate. Nah, they wanted pure glass. They wanted to look amazing. Check out the view. And the reason he started with an icosahedron with its mere 20 faces and not something with 120 faces is because you're starting with equilateral triangles. Yeah. You minimize the number of different types of triangles you're going to end up with once you've done this subdivision process yeah. a couple of times. So he went back to them and said, look, I've come up with this design. You can't do it with all the same sort of triangle. I've kept it to six. I've got a design. Looks a lot like a UFO. Nice equilateral-ish looking triangles. But there are six different types. And they said, no, we want them all the same. Yeah. He then said, you can't have them all the same. And they said, well, why not? And he said, well, in Paul's words, he spent a week trying to convince architects it was impossible to make it out of all the same triangle. 
instead of doing any actual engineering. <laughs> <laughs> this is why maths communication is important. Yeah. He spent a week trying to get across. At one point, they said, well, what about the roof at the British Museum? That's all the same triangle. Sure. And look how complex it is. And if you're not familiar with the courtyard at the British Museum, it's phenomenal. It's an amazing bit of modern architecture and engineering. It's one of the few things in the British Museum that's actually British. It's a really, <laughs> a really nice engineering and architectural achievement. It's made of 3,000... 212 triangles made out of glass. Wow. Which are all different. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I say that. It is symmetric. So they're mirror images. So half of them, strictly speaking, 1,606, and then they're mirror images. Because they didn't care about having the same triangles, it's a really crazy surface. Like, I love it. Yeah, it's beautiful. And there's a single equation that governs the entire courtyard oh. roof. Lovely. So, if you walk, if you know exactly how many meters from the central, there's like a central rotund, like cylindrical building. Mm -hmm. They use the middle of that as the origin. If you know how many meters out and across you've walked from there, you can calculate precisely how high the ceiling is above you at that point using the same equation. It's, ah, lovely. Oh, that's glorious. But what it isn't is an example of what you can do with just one triangle. <laughs> it's what you can do <laughs> if no one cares how many triangles you're using. <laughs> so after a week, Paul finally convinced them that they're going to need six different triangles. Everyone was finally in agreement, six different triangles. We're going to make the bar. It's going to look incredible. But then we have the issue that Steve mentioned before. Where are you going to cut off the dome? You can't cut it mid-triangle. That defeats the whole purpose of the triangle. That just creates more different triangles. And some non-triangles. <laughs> oh you don't want goodness. some quads in there. <laughs> so Paul, like, very carefully got some cut marks that followed the edges of the triangles. Oh, nice. But it meant that the edge of the glass kind of bows up and down a little bit because it's following the contours mm -hmm. of the original edges of the shape, which, for the record... The roof at the British Museum does that. It bows up and down slightly around the edges where you can't see it, where it's resting on top of the walls. So they dealt with that problem that way. The architects came back and said, no, you can't do that. He said, why not? They said, because that's not what a UFO looks like. Uh, I mean, so, so, so they accepted an extra. Uh, I'm just counting them now on the building. Five. Five or six extra pieces to fill wow. in the gaps wow. between the concrete that was flat and the dome. So the little archy bits had a few more bits. Apparently that was fine. And so if anyone is ever in Barcelona, you can go and check out the UFO bar that was the result of an argument over triangles. And you can really see what a UFO does really look it's like. What it, now it, this is officially what a UFO looks like. It's good to finally have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still have one question, though. Yep. Matt, mm -hmm. why are you so obsessed with triangles? Love a good triangle. I feel like there's an ulterior motive oh, maybe. to your triangle obsession. Maybe I've been locked yeah. away for over a year now writing a book all about triangles. I'm, this is my surprise face. <laughs> and were that the kind of thing that was available for pre-order, we'd probably put a link for that in the description somewhere. So this section arguing over the shape of a ufo and how it's going to be engineered well it's currently titled war of the welds <laughs> <laughs> okay. well that's it for now we should just clarify that no triangles were harmed in the making of this episode but they were all different triangles <laughs> and speaking of things that are all different thanks to our listeners we appreciate you tuning in and i just wanted to mention that this podcast is part of the Acast Creator Network. Gosh, it really is, isn't it? <laughs> if you want even more detail, check out the show notes. They're also available at festivalofthespokennerd.com forward slash podcast, not backslash, never that. You'll find some links to things we mentioned in the show and more about where to find Helen's new songs, Matt's new book, and my new videos and stuff. If you're new to the world of Festival of the Spoken Nerd, do take a look at our website, festivalofthespokennerd.com. There's three filmed live shows that you can download for pi pounds each, which is three. 0.14 pounds in real money. How do you say that in real money? I can't remember. 
three pounds and 14 pence. That makes more sense, doesn't it? <laughs> as well as two series of our BBC Radio 4 series and things we have coming up like live shows, live streams and an evening of unnecessary detail. We'd love it if you could rate and review this podcast on places like iTunes or jump on Spotify. Give us some stars. Preferably five. It does make a massive difference and it means we can get more people to listen to the podcast. And that means we can make more episodes. Direct causal link. And if you have any unnecessary detail for us or you just want to get in touch, podcast at festivalofthespokennerd.com is our email. And we're on all the social medias as well. Come and find us and say hi. Thanks. Bye. Bye. A podcast of unnecessary detail is made by Festival of the Spoken Nerd. That's Helen Arney, Steve Mould and Matt Parker. This episode was produced by Laura Grimshaw. Our theme music is by Howard Carter and we are proud to be part of the Acast Creator Network. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 